Most of us know of glass blowing, whether we've done it ourselves or we've seen it in person or seen it on TV or experienced it at our art museum, for example. But you're a scientific glass blower running a scientific glass blowing laboratory. Can you define and distinguish what that is? A scientific glass blower is someone who meets the needs of researchers in the form of glass. They can execute the chemistry, the physics, the mechanical engineering, chemical engineering, the epidemiology. All of these different sciences have to have a way to explore what they're interested in, and glass aids them in that, especially here at Ohio State, because we have a tremendous research community, and glass becomes a part of that, just like any other material. Why is glass the preferred choice for most labware? Well, initially glass was a wonderful material for chemistry because it doesn't react with the reactions that are done in the glassworks. So not very reactive, so therefore safe. The glass that was used to make laboratory ware was called soda lime glass. And those were the earliest forms of glass that were available to use for everything, including windows and for any kind of scientific device and I'm talking about back in the 19th century but somebody came along and invented borosilicate glass and this particular type of glass can also deal with thermal stress. The beautiful thing about borosilicate glass is that it comes in tubes and rob form that are already fabricated for us to keep on the shelf to use as our stock and and then we're able to reheat it, reshape it, change it into what one of our uh, you know, projects demands. So there's a lot of labs around the world, a ton of glassware, everything from beaker to an Erlenmeyer flask to then these more sophisticated kind of distillers. Is all the glass glass blown or are some of them manufactured? In the industry, there's called disposable glassware. And most of those items are, for example, like beakers, pipettes, test tubes, common laboratory glassware that serves a purpose, but it's not a specialized purpose. So that stuff, they use it, they break it, they trash it. It's got very low value. Then we have, you know, our specialized glassware. And we actually have factories that fabricate standard scientific glassware. Not everything is being manufactured. So that's where we come in. And not everything that is manufactured is suitable for the application. So they'll come and we'll either modify it or we'll make something of their own custom design, we'll do a drawing, we'll come up with an idea that we hope will satisfy the need of the, the research, and then um, we'll basically just follow the instructions and make it. Sometimes it's a challenge to do what they want you to do, and that, to me, is the beauty of it. This, for example, is an apparatus for the Department of Epidemiology. It's a reproduction of a hookah pipe. And the part that I make is the top part, we call it the bowl, and the tobacco is actually put in this part here. I also uh, modify this type of flask. It's a 2000 mil disposable flask, like our disposable glass where we talked about earlier. They're testing the smoke that comes off of the apparatus to see how it might affect the human body you know, in harmful ways. The convenience of me being here is that, um, actually this is the first generation of this particular apparatus. The top part here, for example, the initial design was to have these holes installed in the bottom. That was a problem because the liquid from the use of the, the bowl would flow down into the bottom of the rest of the apparatus and we redesigned it and the holes ended up being installed in the inner wall here so that none of the liquid would pass through the cavity of the, of the bowl. So we built a kind of a, a final design over the course of time, the first prototype, the second prototype, and then finally we're really satisfied with that, we're going to keep it. So then I photograph it and I'll keep all of those records in a PDF for that particular professor and then it's a wonderful thing to have a computer with, you know, all of these um, details already worked out. And it saves a lot of time. And 
What do you see as the future for glass blowing in the scientific context? One of the problems with computers is that I can't model everything. So they still have to go to the lab and use glassware to get an end result, a physical result. But I think the future is great. I think if I wanted to work until I'm 90 years old, this job would still be available to me. You built a career out of this. I'm looking at both sides. How did you get into glass blowing and your interest in this field? Well, I'm actually a third generation. And you'll find that there are a lot of us out there that their fathers or their grandfathers were in this profession before them. Uh, however, it's not the only way to get into the profession, but for me, my father had a little shop in the basement. He made, you know, trinkets and that sort of thing. And I was around it all the time as I grew up. And um, one thing led to another and I became a scientific glass blower as well. So as someone who both has in your DNA, but also operates a, a lab in a basic science research and has dabbled both in the art side and the science side, what would you share, what advice could you give to the average person to be interested or how they should think about science? Think about everything around you, everything in your environment and how it arrived in your life. You can look at the simplest things, for instance, your drinking glass. How did it arrive in your life? You know, did it, was it manufactured in a factory? Was it, you know, pressed in a mold? These are the kinds of things that can draw your attention to where something came from. Usually it came from something to do with science. Thank you so much for spending time with us on QED with Dr. B. It was a pleasure to have you on our show. You're welcome. Thanks for having me.